Now that we've investigated the theory of moment of inertia and seen we've seen how to derive it and analyze it, let's look at it for a couple other geometries and then apply it to problem solving as well. Let's consider first a thin walled cylinder. We start with a thin ring, a thin ring. So here's a ring and it's thin in that the thickness of the ring itself is negligible so the mass all exists from the point of rotation which is at the geometric center here the mass is at radius r all of it so let's take a little delta m and consider that the moment of inertia of the ring is delta m r squared delta m1 r squared plus the next one plus the next one etc all the delta m r squareds which is m ring r squared you can all simplify down to the total mass of the ring times radius squared because every point of mass on the ring is distance r away, the same r. So we have mass of the ring times the radius squared. And now we're going to just stack these rings like this so that we have, in effect, a thin walled cylinder. Well, what have we really changed? Haven't we just added up a whole bunch of rings? And so the, the formula really shouldn't be modified, should it? Everything that is at radius r still. But now the mass of the ring, all the rings added up becomes the mass of the cylinder. So the moment of inertia for the cylinder is the total mass times radius squared. So that's the moment of inertia for a thin walled cylinder. And it's like a pipe or a tube. And this occurs quite a bit in engineering, quite a bit in practical examples. We have the thin walled cylinder under our belts now. Now let's uh, extend that to a thick walled cylinder. So here's a cylinder with non negligible thickness of the walls. And we'll consider it of length L and the uh, radii will be R1 and R2. So we're going to consider a, a differential R within the thick walled region here. So that differential R, of course, is differential. And if we imagine, kind of hard to show this in the perspective, but if we imagine putting a, a carving out basically a tube or a thin walled cylinder of radius R, out of this thick walled cylinder we have this so I just inserted a thin walled cylinder I know it doesn't look exactly right but this extends into the material right and it's of thickness dr so hopefully that makes sense so what I've just done is you know kind of tried to show a thin walled cylinder a tube placed inside here well you can imagine this tube will have different radii all the way out from R1 to R2 so you know what we're going to do. We're going to add up all the tubes to analyze this problem. So let's do that. So every differentially thin cylinder, like this one I show here, is part of the whole thick walled cylinder. So the differential moment of inertia of that differentially thin cylinder is R squared dm. We already did the analysis on that. So that's what we just did. Now dm is rho dv, so we can say r squared rho dv, because we want, we can't, we're not going to be able to integrate with respect to dm. And so rho dv, well dv, the v, differential volume, is the differential volume of the entire cylinder. Now not the volume that that cylinder would hold, not the volume of space it, it, it surrounds, so to speak but the material of the differentially thin cylinder itself. All right, so that's gonna be given by the circumference of the cylinder times the length of it, and then times the thickness. So again, that is the volume, in this case, the differential volume, because it's dr, the differential volume of that tube, that differentially thin cylinder that's inserted in the thick walled one. Hopefully that makes sense. Then the moment of inertia of the entire thick walled cylinder 
is basically adding up the contribution of all these differentially thin cylinders. So it'd be the integral of the di's. And to expand that, we'd go from r1 to r2 of the r squared dm's. And so that takes us, brings us the fundamental equation. We're going to, of course, now stick in for dm. We're going to stick in this whole thing. So let's do that. So it's integral of r squared rho 2 pi r l dr. And the density 2 pi r, I'm sorry, not 2 pi r, but density 2 pi and l are all constants. We can bring them out. Integral r1 to r2 of r to the third. So that's constant r to the fourth over 4 from r1 to r2. And that simplifies to rho pi l over 2 times the outer radius to the fourth minus the inner radius to the fourth. So that's pretty good. That's the moment of inertia of that cylinder, but we really don't want it in terms of the density. And we really like it in terms of more fundamental quantities like the mass. And this is going to actually be simplified also. So let's work on this equation just a little bit. So we can actually expand that last expression as follows r2 squared plus r1 squared times r2 squared minus r1 squared times the constant in front. And that may not look very helpful, but it actually is, as you'll see, because we can consider the entire mass of the cylinder as being equal to the density times the volume. So the mass of the thick-walled cylinder is density times volume. But we don't want to include in the volume the volume of the whole. So let's expand this a little bit. So it's the density times the volume of the entire cylinder, pi r squared L, the outer region. But we have to subtract from that the volume of the whole. So that's just rho pi r1 squared L. That would be the volume of the whole. So subtracting those two, we get rho pi L r2 squared minus r1 squared. And that is equal to the mass. Well, very fortunately, we have this and this. That is this whole term here. That's wonderful. That really simplifies this expression. Wow. wow. To this, moment of inertia is 1 half m, r2 squared minus r1 squared. So that is the formula for the thick-walled cylinder, two different radii. Now, if r1 is 0, which means it's a solid cylinder, so just eliminate this. And we get 1 half mr squared. So that's the formula for a solid cylinder. And that comes up a lot. Notice it's exactly half of the moment of inertia of a thin-walled cylinder, or a ring. If r1 is approximately equal to r2 in the thick-walled cylinder, so set them about equal, well, that means it's approaching a thin-walled cylinder, right? So we have 1 half m, just r1 is about equal to r2, so you just call it r. So we have 1 half m r squared plus r squared, which is, again, mr squared. The same thing we got for a thin-walled cylinder. And basically, if you have that, then the r's are all the same. Every delta m is r away from the axis. So the sum of all those little delta m's is the total mass. Let's now consider. Oh, that's awful. Hope you're awake. A strong mass is cable wrapped around a drum. That's a solid cylinder of mass 50 kilograms, diameter 0.12 meters. Rotates freely on a stationary axis. So that's this axis here that it's got a bearing it goes through the center and it's of no friction the end of the cable is pulled with a constant force of nine newtons for two meters the cylinder is going to start from rest and we're going to figure out the angular velocity at the end of that two meters and the speed of the cable so this is an energy problem for us right now work is equal to delta k force times distance is delta k well, now what kind of k do we have? Do we have translational or do we have rotational? Whoops, this way. And you know we have rotational. 
So rotational kinetic energy we've now covered and we have the difference so it's the final one half i omega squared minus the initial one half i omega zero squared. Well it started from rest so that term is gone and now we can solve for omega because we have this and this f dot d is equal to one half i omega squared but first let's get the moment of inertia which we know is one half mr squared because we just obtained that for the solid cylinder and that number is 25 times 0.06 squared which is 0.09 kilogram meter squared now omega would just be multiply both sides by 2 divide by i take the square root square root of 2 fd over i plug the numbers in square root of 420 radians per second that wasn't too tough the speed at the end of the of the cable itself well the speed is equal to r omega so the radius times the angular velocity gives you the speed so that's the speed of the cable and that would give us 0.06 times 20 1.2 meters per second let's do an example where we're looking at the moment of inertia of a little structure consisting of point masses I know it doesn't look like point masses but these connectors, as they're called, are considered point masses at the end of these struts. And what we're going to do is look at rotating it about an axis through A. So it's going to be spinning around like this. Then we're going to rotate it through BC and have it spin around. It's kind of hard to show, but spin around that axis of symmetry. Check the moments of inertia. And then get the kinetic energy also for uh, spinning at four radians per second so moment of inertia through a is the sum of the miris squared and that's 0 0.1 there's 0 0.1 times 0 0.5 that's the distance from this axis of rotation to the connector plus the mass of c which is 0 0.2 times the distance 0 0.4 squared and that gives us 0.057 kilogram meters squared. Now let's rotate it through BC. And of course, these point masses are going to have no moment of inertia rotated about this axis. So the thing I want to clarify in this little example problem, these look like thick walled cylinders, but they're really not. They're so small that they have no effective R in and of themselves. So just, just deal with that, all right? So that's zero plus zero plus the contribution of this mass but rotated about here that distance is 0.4 meters of the 0.3 kilogram mass so 0.3 times 0.4 squared 0.048 kilogram meters squared obviously they're different so that highlights how different axes of symmetry will give you different moments of inertia and when omega is 4 radians per second if we're rotating about the a axis ka is 1 half i omega squared 0.456 joules. I'll finish this video with a very important problem type that you will certainly see again. Ooh, there's a wonderful sound. We have a solid cylinder of mass M, big M, at radius R, attached to a wall somewhere. And hanging off of that, we have a mass m and this thing is pivoting frictionlessly on a bearing here and we're going to figure out if we release it from rest at height h what the speed of the mass is when it hits the floor and what the angular velocity of the wheel is so this is going to be done with energy here at this point and thus we can say total work is delta k but this is going to be a little bit different than before. We start the same way with our energy expression. K1 plus UG1 is K2 plus UG2. And K1 is 0 because it starts from rest. And UG2 is 0 because the mass ends up on the floor. And this thing is not going to fall down. So there's no translational energy in the, in the wheel or the cylinder but it does have rotational energy so we have k2 is ug1 and we're going to expand k2 now 
So as before, as we've always done, one half mv squared. Okay, the kinetic energy of translation of this mass. But now we have to add another term. And the term we're going to add, of course, is the rotational energy of the solid cylinder. And we know what the moment of inertia is already, but let's just go ahead and write out the energy, which is one half i omega squared. So both of these factors now have to be taken together to equal the MGH, which is the total mechanical energy of the system. So that is how you work the energy for a problem like this. And now keep in mind I is 1 half mr squared and omega is v over r. So we're going to use that to sub in. So we have 1 half mv squared plus 1 half of I, which is 1 half mr squared. So there it is. There's I. And then omega squared. Omega is v over r. So we put for omega squared, v squared over r squared equals mgh. Notice that the r squareds cancel. That's wonderful. It's radius independent for a problem like this. So the next line, 1 half mv squared plus 1 fourth big mv squared equals mgh. So there's both terms. Now, it's kind of interesting to look at this. 1 half mv squared, we understand what that is. 1 fourth mv squared. If you think of mass m, the wheel, translating at v, then its translational kinetic energy would be 1 half big mv squared, half of what you, or twice what you see this to be. The rotational kinetic energy ends up being half what the translational kinetic energy would be if this mass were moving at speed v. And if this doesn't make sense, don't worry. But the way you can make sense of that is the moment of inertia is 1 half mr squared. Now, 1 half mr squared is half of the moment of inertia of a thin-walled cylinder. If this was a, a thin-walled cylinder, then the moment of inertia would be just mr squared, which is, happens to be the largest the moment of inertia can be for a regular body rotating about its center of mass. All right, so in that case, the moment of inertia would be double, and this would be 1 half big MV squared. The way to, th to make sense of that, then, is that if the moment of inertia of the object is as large as it can be with all of its mass distributed at the edge, a thin-walled cylinder, remember, the position of the mass has a lot to do with the moment of inertia, and it's R squared, so it has a large effect putting the mass as far away as you can. If we do that, then the way the rotational inertia works is that it makes this rotating mass look as though it's a translating mass, and the, the rotational kinetic energy would be equal to the translational kinetic energy, one half mv squared. But we have 1 fourth mv squared because it's a solid cylinder, which would be the same as a disk. Again, if you didn't follow all that, I'll probably hit that again, but it's a really important conceptual concept. So I wanted to present that to you. Now, solving this thing, we want to solve for the speed. So factor out the v squared, which is mgh. Now what I'm going to do is multiply this whole thing by 2, and that'll make this 2mgh and get rid of this half and make this quarter. It'll make it a half. So v is square root of 2mgh over m plus m over 2. Now, I don't like having m in two places because it's really hard to see how the speed varies with little m in this. So let's multiply it by 1 over m over 1 over m. And we get our final answer with the variables express 1. Square root of 2gh over 1 plus big M over 2 little m. Wasn't that fun?